Um, let's actually dig right into it and in particular start with this uh, question about whether high heart rate is uh, is dangerous or not. And uh, that is actually one, it is tied to one topic that I, or, or one concern or myth that I had throughout my entire life is that the sport is destructive. Uh, training too much is, is really harmful and you get uh, long-term damage and, uh, and, and then basically you will end up in a, in a wheelchair or with a replaced hip. And uh, today we'll try to debunk that myth. Um, heart rate in itself is essentially the number of beats our heart makes during a minute. That's why it's expressed in a, in a BPM, so beats per minute. And um, the purpose of the entire cardiovascular system is essentially to transport oxygen and uh, nutrients into the body and, uh, and then transport carbon dioxide back into uh back into lungs and um uh, what kind of whatever we go through on a daily basis be it physi physiological or mental stress uh, that represents a different demands that is placed on the body so whenever there is more stress or more demand on our on our body for for example for nutrients for oxygen or thermoregulation our heart needs to beat, uh, needs to beat uh, faster. So for example, we are walking faster, then our muscles need more energy, our muscles need more nutrients, so our heart rate beats faster. Or for example, it's a particularly hot day, our, blood, uh, our heart needs to beat faster in order to bring the, um, uh, need to bring blood closer to our skin to ensure that um, we, we start sweating and, and cool ourselves ourselves off. And for example, if we are tired, then um, heart rate uh, heart needs to beat faster in order to deliver the, the nutrients and oxygen again uh, much quicker. And uh, all of all of that, that heart rate can be impacted by many different factors. As I mentioned, weather, sleep, uh, past training and even uh, our emotions can also impact the, the heart rate as well. But um, the question is um, um, why there is the concern about the high heart rate? And concern primarily comes from, um, from a, a notion that if we exercise at high intensity, then the heart spends, the heart contracts too fast, too quickly, and uh, it is uh, in a so-called hypoxic state, so it get, doesn't get enough nutrients, and due to the fact that it doesn't get enough nutrients, there is a certain heart damage. Uh, to kind of break it up a little bit, the, um, during a heartbeat, there are two different um, phases. One is a systole and one is a diastole. Systole is the contraction of the heart. This is uh, this, this image on the right. And basically it's the contraction of the left ventricle of the, um, of the heart that contains the oxygen-enriched blood. And um, with that contraction, the blood leaves the heart and uh, it supplies with oxygen all of uh, our internal or organs. And at the time when the heart spans in the systole phase, it doesn't get nutrients. And it is supposed to be then in a hypoxic state. Hypoxic meaning kind of it's in this um, oxygen hunger state. But then after systole comes the diastole state, that's the relaxation of the heart. It's when um, it um, uh, heart walls fill up with, uh, with blood and uh, the heart gets its nutrients. And... Um, Kind of when the heart, the myth from or the concern comes that the, when the muscle contracts a lot, let's say 180, 190 or so beats per minute, it spends a lot of time in a systole in a systole state, and um, basically, as I mentioned already, it doesn't it stays in this hypoxic, it doesn't get enough nutrients, and uh, it um, uh, it, it becomes damaged. And as you repeat it on a, I don't know, weekly or daily basis over many years, it gets um, damaged. 
in reality, in reality, physio- physiology of the heart is quite unique. And even though when the ha- heart rate might be high, um, the heart itself has a lot of capillary vessels around it. They form like a crown, which is why they are called coronary system. And uh, they, the heart itself is a muscle and it contains super many mitochondria. And mitochondria is the, um, uh, the kind of the energy units of our cells. They provide energy, they process oxygen, and, uh, and basically supply ourselves with uh, our, our muscles with energy. And um, we cannot train any muscle in our body to be as efficient as our heart because we are not able to build as many mitochondria in any one of our, our mass, uh, in any one of our muscles. And um, this, the fact that it has so many mitochondria means that uh, it doesn't get into anaerobic state. So our, our heart never goes into a hypoxic state when, the, but, uh, when it doesn't have enough, uh, enough oxygen. So kind of, that uh, hopefully partly answers some of the concerns behind uh, the heart, uh, high heart rate. But then the question is why some of the athletes have higher heart rate and some have a lower heart rate for the same, uh, for the same effort. And um, for example, for two people who are running at, so let's say, five minutes per kilometer. For one person, that can be 130 beats per minute. For another, that can be 150. And for another, it can be 170. And all three of them can feel can feel differently. And it comes from all of the different kind of aerobic components that go into our training, um, our training preparation. And in particular, stroke volume, meaning how much blood the heart pumps out with each beat. And I found some statistics. So for untrained person, that can be 60 milliliters per uh, per one beat that the, that the heart pumps out. For someone who is relatively kind of active or, or doing some sort of uh, aerobic activity, occasionally runs, for example, or or, or um, runs 5Ks or something like this, that can be somewhere between 100 and 140. And for elite people who are really in like running, for example, a marathon under 230, uh, for them, each beat can, can mean that 200 milliliters of blood are leaving the blood system uh, after every beat, which is basically three or even four times more than for a regular person. So obviously, the for elites, uh, the, we don't need that many circulation across the um, across the system to provide all of the muscles with the relevant uh, with the necessary oxygen and, and nutrients. Then obviously the capillary network. So how many pathways are there? Um, and here I like the example of let's say some big city with a lot of blank spots and there are lots of just uh, big roads without small intersections and for example a big city like New York or, or London where there are tons of tiny streets and if you need to go somewhere then you don't need to take like a, a big route that would take you I don't know 15 or 20 minutes you can cut straight through it uh, then the next part is the amount of uh, blood in our um, in our body. It's called blood plasma, and trained people tend to have much more blood circulating through their system, and that comes partly because they have this developed capillary network, uh, and those capillaries obviously cannot be cannot be empty. They they need to be filled with blood. Uh, then the um, level of hemoglobin and myoglobin and hemoglobin is the one that transports oxygen to to internal organs and then carbon dioxide back to back to the lungs and myoglobin is the um, is is what helps to extract the oxygen into the into the working muscles so if hemoglobin expresses the oxygen carrying capacity then myoglobin is 
uh, how effective we are at using that oxygen because it can happen that all of that oxygen will just be circulated and the muscles will not take any, anything of it. And uh, kind of getting more into some strength related topics, the ability to recruit muscle fibers, that's also an important part and that um, uh, explains the, uh, the efficiency part of it, of the, of the equation. So kind of uh, typically if someone has a high heart rate compared to, to another person for the same effort, that can be, well, first of all, it can mean several different things, but uh, also uh, most probably it's a signal that the heart rate is not developed to its, uh, to its full capacity. And uh, personally, I trained with, uh, with another person where we were of a similar level, but he always had a 10, per, 10 beats per minute lower heart rate than me. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I was just looking at the heart rate kind of for fun without any specific um, uh, specific um, plan for it. And I was always thinking, oh, he's um, kind of, he's exercising much easier. So for him, the effort that we're going through was much easier, but I didn't kind of, uh, I didn't know all of the background of the heart rate training beside, I didn't know what was his stroke volume, uh, what was the capillary network, kind of how, how his internal systems are, are dialed in, because that's ultimately what is the, um, uh, what predicts later on how, how do you, um, how do you perform? And, um, but there can be a vice versa situation. There can be a person with a very low heart rate, for example, I don't know, 120 for uh, five minutes per kilometer. And um, I had um, an, an athlete like this, so it looks like he had a very high stroke, um, uh, stroke volume. Uh, he looked like an elite um, athlete. So he was running five minutes per kilometer with 120 heart rate. But his efficiency, the ability to extract the oxygen from um, into working muscles was quite low. So when he reached the four minutes per, uh, per kilometer, his heart rate was already at 170 and that was actually his anaerobic uh, threshold, uh, past his anaerobic threshold. And um, he was a very interesting person. He, he was a 10 year, uh, he was a yogi with 10 year experience and his VO2 maximum also was around 60 or 65 uh, measured in a lab, which, uh, uh, which correlates to quite a, almost an elite level athlete, but he was only able to maintain those four minutes for, for, for one minute. So something was not adding up. So there, there are more kind of topics to it. And uh, in general, this kind of uh, whole heart rate science is a little bit uh, new. Prior to the 90s, there were a lot of attention on uh, strength training and that then um, magazines switched to, to cardio training, aerobics and everything. Uh, but all of that is quite uh, some, a little kind of summarized, simplified because of basically what, what I just told. As you, as you might have noticed, it's very hard to kind of tell exactly what's a person's myoglobin level or, or what's his... Uh, Prior to the 90s, point, there were a lot of things like that. Um, so basically, it takes some time and experience to get to... Um, to the bottom of this where kind of uh, where you can make actual conclusions and and use that and uh, for me it took multiple years and multiple trips to to laboratory tests to understand how this whole exercise physiology stuff works and um, that's um, that's what we'll, we will discuss uh, today there is uh, quite a lot of research that is developing on this there is now accessible technology where we have heart rate on our on our wrists. There are quite a lot of books already and uh, and methods, in particular the you know, heart rate training method, the 80-20 protocol, where 20% for high intensity, 80% to low intensity. There is a very popular Maffeton method where you create a heart rate 
uh, heart rate cap and then basically train under that. All of it is um, is relevant. All of it is uh, is important. But uh, in in today's webinar, I will explain kind of how to put all of the all of the pieces together. And um, it also doesn't help that um, all of the not all of the sorry, uh, quite a few influencers are. Um, basically not into heart rate training and they or not many pros are actually using the heart rate training to its full extent many were just like i was they were just looking at the numbers and a coach hopefully would interpret those uh, those results and what i personally i don't know read a lot or, or hear a lot that this heart rate stuff is really imprecise and it's imprecise because um, there are many different factors affecting our, our body. So we cannot only look at one specific factor. In particular, um, in some studies refer that dehydration, a few percent, um, like two or three percent dehydration can really increase our heart rate by, as you see, close to seven and a half percent. Then heat and humidity tend to increase our heart rate by at least 10, 10 beats per minute. So if you would go somewhere to, uh, to a hot country where it's plus 35 and high humidity and you go out for a run, your heart rate would be at least 10 beats, uh, 10 beats higher. And if you would try to uh, maintain the same pace that you are using in, uh, in training, so a lot of people train by pace, and if you would you try to stick to that, then it wouldn't be possible um, just because the body would be exercising higher, uh, harder, uh, even though it would it stayed at uh, at that specific uh, at that specific at that particular pace. So some adjustments need to be made. Um, altitude can increase the heart rate as well, and there is always this um, question about the chest wrap versus wrist heart rate. Or now there is technology where you place it on your um, on your bicep and then it, it takes the uh, heart rate from there kind of to answer that uh, the most accurate data that you can get would be from a chest strap which goes under your under your chest muscles first of all because the heart beats there and uh, it recognizes the, the heartbeat right away second of all it uses the electrode method compared to you know apple watches or the wrist hrs that are using light sensors those are not as precise and when you have uh, your watch on your wrist then it always bounces as you as you do the movement so it's not a uh, it's not as precise but okay let's um, kind of let's move on into this whole stress topic and as i mentioned with the as an example with the with the heat and humidity um, kind of this is a graph of a so-called supercompensation effect that's the core of all of the exercise physiology so when we inflict some sort of resistance or or stress on our body after a period of rest our body not re not only recovers to its initial level but it jumps a little bit higher because it's smart it, it understands that we're probably gonna uh, do the same thing to it and uh, kind of the timing of the of your next training session uh, will define how whether you will progress or not um, and as you see we have the initial performance level and um, then we do a training session which inflicts stress on our body and after we recover it goes into super compensation effect for a brief period of time and then it goes into a detraining phase. So basically, if we take a train next training session when we're under recovered, then we will not see that initial performance. So we inflict more stress, and vice versa. If we do it too late, then our body will go into a detraining phase. Um, and uh, it's not only the training stress that is in this uh, red bubble it's basically any stress as i mentioned if we if we go for a run in in heat and humidity and try to maintain the same uh, same pace and same effort uh, or same pace and same or same speed as we would do in regular environments then that 
heat and humidity would add additional stress and it wouldn't be the same amount of stress that we have planned for a training session, but even more. Uh, it's okay if we plan for that additional, stre uh, additional stress, but uh, more often than not, uh, we, are, we aren't. 